and welcome to the Thunderbro Hypertrophy for Functional Fitness Training Camp. I'm Dave Whitson, co-founder of Thunderbro. Let's get it on. At Thunderbro, our mission is bridging the gap between performance and aesthetics. We don't just want you to look amazing, but we want you to be able to use your body and perform at the highest levels. Essentially, we're bridging the gap between two communities, the bodybuilding community and the functional fitness community. So this is where we're gonna start, understanding the connection between performance and aesthetics. Whether you realize it or not, elite athletes tend to look like elite athletes. There's a reason why the athletes at the CrossFit Games have big popping shoulders, pecs, abs, and quad sweeps. There's a reason why Mike Trout has tree trunks for arms. Maybe they've developed this amazing physicality due to the demands of their sport or their training, or maybe they can meet those demands because they have that physicality. Whether it's one or the other doesn't really matter as long as we understand that there's a connection there. We don't just want you to be able to look the part, but we want you to be able to express your fitness across a broad spectrum of capacities. We run into all different types of scenarios where we can see one end of the spectrum or the other. For instance, every year, Thunderbro gets to go to the Arnold and hosts a boost at the Arnold Fitness Festival. This is the mecca of bodybuilding. You're walking in a room filled up with the world's biggest, strongest freaks, from bodybuilding to strongman, all the way down to CrossFit. And as you're walking through this venue, your head will spin off your shoulders, looking at guys like bodybuilders with amazing amounts of musculature. This type of imposing physicality really garners a lot of attention. They've developed their body to this very, very extreme. However, having been in that bodybuilding community, I can tell you that many of these bodybuilders are display models only. They have these incredible, powerful machines, but they're not so great at using them outside the scope of hypertrophy training or using them with isolation movements. Please don't ask Phil Heath, the seven-time Mr. Olympia, to run a mile because it's not gonna go well. In fact, you might find a lot of housewives out there or recreational athletes that can do way more pull-ups than Phil because he's taken that body to the very extreme of the extreme with regard to just developing musculature. Now in the contrast of that, at this same event, there's a CrossFit competition. And I'm always blown away at watching these CrossFitters and their ability to use their body so efficiently. There's no other athlete out there that can get more bang for their buck out of their body than CrossFitters across a broad spectrum of physical tasks. I'm sitting there and I'm watching 45 year old housewives do 35 pull-ups in a row. I'm watching guys that are 155 pounds deadlift 400 pounds. However, I can tell you firsthand, being in that room with all those athletes, that the CrossFitter's physicality is non-remarkable with regard to that context. So our goal is to maybe merge the two communities together. Maybe give CrossFitters a little bit more aesthetics and musculature, maybe giving bodybuilders a little bit more functionality and longevity to be able to make it a sustainable and healthy lifestyle. Bridging this gap requires an understanding in the context of an athlete's hardware and an athlete's software. Hardware is the actual machine. You guys probably have computers at home or cell phones. Well, the computer, its size, its processing power is the hardware. That's what gives it its potential. But the software makes it work efficiently, allows it to do different things. And the same thing can be said with athletes. An athlete's hardware is their physical body. What's their contractile potential? How much muscular do they have to potentially tap into? And their software are their motor patterns or how efficiently they're able to use that body across a broad spectrum of tasks. One way we can describe fitness is with the list of the 10 general physical skills. This is a list of probable adaptations one could have to a fitness program. And they include things like cardiorespiratory endurance, stamina strength and flexibility, power and speed, coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance. Now these top four adaptations here, cardiorespiratory endurance, stamina, strength, and flexibility, we can categorize these as predominantly being organic adaptations, meaning that there's actually a physical change that takes place in the tissue. There's a change that's occurring within the hardware. These bottom four, coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance, they're what we might categorize as predominantly neurological adaptations, improving the way that the brain communicates with the body through practice. This is what we could consider developing the software. 
And these middle two, power and speed, can be improved through both. We can make you more powerful or faster by making you more efficient at how you use your body, or we can make you a bigger and stronger machine. And at Thunderbro, that's what our focus is, focusing on some of those biological adaptations a little bit more to give you a more formidable machine or increased hardware to work with. The way that we garner these biological adaptations or improvements in your hardware is through a process known as hypertrophy. Hypertrophy describes one way that cells can adapt to stress. This stress can include inflammation, an increased workload, or hormonal stimulation. When a cell increases in size beyond its normal size, it's gone through hypertrophy. There are lots of different types of hypertrophy that can occur within the body. For the sake of what we're talking about, we're referring to hypertrophy of the skeletal muscle. There are lots of interesting adaptations that occur at a microscopic level within the cell when it goes through hypertrophy. Organelles are the cell's internal machinery. They're the stuff inside the cell. And when a cell goes through hypertrophy, there are lots of different adaptations that occur to these organelles. Mitochondria are the cell's internal power generators. They allow it to do work. And when a cell goes through hypertrophy, we can see things like an increased amount of mitochondria within the cell to say accommodate to an increased workload. The endoplasmic reticulum is the cell's internal manufacturing processor. And when a cell goes through hypertrophy, the endoplasmic reticulum will increase in size, thus allowing it to produce more. And finally, the plasma or fluid within the cell, generally made of proteins, tends to increase in amount as the cell starts to enlarge. Now, if we take a step back a little bit farther from the cell to the muscle fiber level, we can see some really interesting adaptations that occur within these fibers. Muscle hypertrophy can be seen as a bulking or thickening of muscle fibers. This is primarily an adaptation to the stress that we're exposing ourselves to in training because muscles are smart and they want to survive. Now within muscle fibers, there are some really interesting components that are important players for hypertrophy. Myofilaments describe the bonds between myosin and actin proteins. These are connections that allow muscles to contract. Now these myosin and actin bonds will not only increase in number due to muscle hypertrophy, but they will all also increase in thickness and in strength, allowing muscles to have an increased contractile potential to be able to do more and harder work in the future. Yes, getting bigger and stronger are often synonymous with each other because of this process. So there are some specific mechanisms or processes that occur within the body that allow us to elicit or garner muscle hypertrophy more specifically. These mechanisms can be directly connected to specific training practices to be able to tap into them a bit more effectively to target hypertrophy to almost be a little bit more specific within your training principles to be able to get bigger and stronger. Muscle tension refers to the specific type of mechanical loading you're exposing your muscles to with regard to magnitude, frequency, and duration. Magnitude meaning how intense or how many motor units are required to recruit to be able to do the work. This is primarily what we're thinking about as heavy loading. Frequency meaning how often you're loading. What's the total volume of load on that muscle? And finally, duration is how long that muscle is under tension. Muscles are very, very smart. They contain within them mechanosensors, tiny things like Golgi tendon organelles that will communicate with the brain to tell you how heavy the load is, what the range of motion is, or what the plane of movement is. These communications can occur within split seconds. So there are different ways that we can manipulate the magnitude of muscle tension within our training. The first thing we can do is simply going heavy. We want to expose a muscle to a type of stress that we haven't been exposed to before. So simply by working top end strength 80% or more in a way that we have not done previously allows an adaptation response within muscles. Beyond just putting more weight on the bar and going heavier, there are different ways we can manipulate those mechanosensors within muscles to be able to get them to freak out a little bit. I know you guys may have heard the words muscle confusion before. I've heard Arnold say it, I've heard the P90X guy say it, and they're actually quite correct. By doing things a little bit differently, oftentimes this can be a catalyst to muscle adaptations and even growth. 
So, by playing with different types of resistance within our training, for instance, using things like dynamic resistance, where the resistance changes during the planes of motion by attaching bands or chains to bar. By doing things like overload eccentrics, where we lower more weight down than we can press up by maybe having somebody press down on the bar for us and then help it up through the concentric or positive ranges of motion or even using different types of things like isometrics that we have not been exposed to by, for instance, pairing or complexing dynamic movements with isometric movements or just contracting and holding still. This is different types of mechanical tension that can help garner that adaptation response. And then finally, we can always play with different exercises. Exercise variety is key. You want to expose yourself to things that you haven't done. So do things with different grips, different stances, different bars, different planes and ranges of motion. Maybe if you normally do pull-ups with an overhand grip, you start flipping your hands over a little bit more by doing more chin-ups. Simply by doing that, that can be a huge catalyst to muscle growth because we haven't worked muscles in that way as frequently. By doing things like modifying the range of motion, for instance, doing heavy rack pulls instead of full deadlifts, we can achieve a different level of mechanical loading by modifying the range of motion. Or even looking at different planes of movement. If you normally do push-ups and bench press in a sagittal plane, simply by exposing yourself to something like an increase, uh, incline bench press or even a decline bench press can be enough to be able to elicit that hypertrophic response because it's different. And those mechanosensors are smart, they want to survive, and that adaptation usually occurs pretty dang quick. The next mechanism we're talking about here is the frequency of the muscle tension. This refers to the volume. So we can always manipulate the volume of loading, incrementally increasing the amount of reps or works that we're doing, kind of as a steady state, period, uh, periodized type of thing, or incrementally increasing that work, causing the body to respond to those new stresses. We can look at the types of training splits that we're doing. Maybe if we normally train back or chest once a week, we could start training those things two times a week. That increased frequency can cause an adaptation. And then finally, just decreasing the rest between those body parts, being able to force it to try to heal and adapt a little bit quicker, maybe then it's even formally remodeled, can help get that adaptation response. Finally, the duration. The duration refers to the amount of time under tension that we're exposing muscles to. So by doing things a little bit differently, maybe not necessarily just for speed or load, but maybe keeping the muscle under tension by holding onto the bar longer, by introducing things like tempos, where we have longer eccentric negative portions of movement or concentric positive portions of movement, or even isometrics can, he, he, can help keep the muscle under tension a little bit longer, a little bit more than it's used to, to be able to get that hypertrophic response. All of these training factors come within that category of muscle tension. So when we're talking about this, again, from a macro perspective, Go heavy, use different types of resistance, use different types of exercises, um, do things with different levels of volume, and play around with the duration of loading by keeping muscles under tension in ways that you're not normally accustomed to. The next mechanism we're gonna talk about is metabolic stress. Metabolic stress refers to the acute hypoxia or lack of oxygen that can occur within muscles when it's tasked with a lot of work at lighter weights done pretty fast. Now, this acute hypoxia is primarily due to the buildup of hydrogen and lactate. When muscles contract, they actually create chemical conversions that allow a molecule called ATP or adenosine triphosphate to occur. Now, due to this buildup of hydrogen and lactate, and the amount of oxygen that's being eaten up by the mitochondria, the cell's internal power generators. This allows cells to actually swell and fill up with fluid, not just within the cell, but between the cells. Now this swelling is a very important signal that the body recognizes that causes it to have an anabolic or muscle growing response. In addition to that, by stressing the amount of mitochondria and the amount of work that we're doing within the muscles, we get an increased amount of mitochondrial density, an important adaptation for the future to allow us to do more work. 
So if we're in the gym and we're trying to elicit a lot of metabolic stress, the answer is pretty simple. You're gonna take a light weight, something anywhere from 40 to 60%, and you're gonna try to do it to failure. We love using things like bands or lighter dumbbells because we can do long sets to failure, things that last anywhere from 60 to 120 seconds long, or actually building up that metabolic stress to the point where you can barely tolerate it anymore. If it burns, you're doing it right. Remember when Arnold was talking about his pump? Well, there was a little bit of science behind that. Another thing we can do to elicit metabolic stress is shortening the rest period. By truncated rest periods, we can actually start to accumulate and compound that stress over a number of sets. So by the time you get to your last few sets, we should be pretty dang close to failure, even with a really lightweight. The last mechanism we're going to talk about is muscle damage. Muscle damage refers to the micro tearing that can occur within muscle fibers as a response to the training. Now if we look at the muscle fiber, we can see this damage occurring in multiple places. The sarcolemma is the outer membrane sheath of muscle fibers. It's the outer covering that covers all those fibers. When we get muscle damage, we can see large tears in the sarcolemma that occur. Now the important thing here is not just that the tears occur, but that they heal correctly. Because when these tears heal, they remodel. And they don't just remodel the same, but they remodel thicker and stronger. This is a very important catalyst to what we see in muscle hypertrophy, the bulking or thickening of those muscle fibers. Another thing that can occur is damage to the myosin and actin bonds within the muscle fibers. These are the connective hooks that shorten and lengthen to allow those muscles to contract. And when muscle damage occurs, we can see damage to those myosin and actin bonds or myofilaments. And when these myofilaments remodel, not only will they remodel thicker and stronger, but they will remodel more numerous, which is a great analog to increased contractile potential of muscles, allowing you to contract muscles harder and stronger. One of the most powerful catalysts for eliciting muscle damage within your training is proper utilization of eccentrics. Eccentrics can be seen as the negative portions of movements, when muscles are lengthening, not shortening. Now this muscle lengthening, especially under load, under tempo, or under control, is actually lengthening those fibers and stressing those bonds while resisting. So this damage can occur quite effectively by using things like tempos in your negative training. Anything from three to five or even 10 seconds long, or even taxing an increased volume of eccentrics, doing things with tempos for higher reps. Now, I know we've talked about things like rhabdomyolysis before. Rhabdomyolysis is a rapid breakdown of muscle tissue that can overwhelm the kidneys. And this also is in conjunction with things like muscle soreness. So how much muscle damage is too much muscle damage and how much is not enough? Well, if we're trying to elicit muscle damage, we don't want to be so sore that we are sore for days on end. This can actually have a negative or catabolic effect of muscles where they can actually begin wasting, not growing. Delayed onset muscle soreness is a very normal process that occurs within conjunction of muscle damage. What this is, is where you feel a little bit sore 24 to 48 hours after training. This is an appropriate level of muscle damage for most. In fact, that soreness is a good signal that that healing and remodeling is taking place. But if that soreness is lingering for weeks or days on end, that may be a little bit too much. This is obviously very contextual to the athlete, to their age, to their training state, and their background. So make sure that if you're trying to elicit muscle damage, you're not walking away scot-free and never sore, and you're not limping around for weeks. Anywhere in between is pretty good. So now we're gonna review all the different types of training factors that correlate with those mechanisms that drive hypertrophy. Starting from the top with muscle tension and working all the way back down through metabolic stress and finally muscle damage. So the first thing we talked about was heavy loading. Being able to expose muscles to a level of mechanical tension that they're unaccustomed to. And we can do this by using things like dynamic resistance, putting bands or chains on the bar, using overload eccentrics where we're lowering more weight that we can move concentrically back on the way up, 
using things like isometrics and different types of holds, working muscles in a bit of a different way. Tempos, doing things slow on the way down or the way up. Double contractions where we do things like half reps into full reps. And then finally, using different types of complexes where we can combine these things together in different ways. Different exercises, different planes of movement, different types of equipment and grips, all important for getting a different level of muscle tension. Then we started talking about the different ways we can manipulate the volume, the frequency of muscle tension. We talked about overloading volume progressively or doing things a little bit more frequently, training muscle groups before they've fully recovered. Also, looking at the amount of total time under tension, doing reps that might take a little bit longer, 60 to maybe even 120 seconds long. The second mechanism we talked about was metabolic stress, that acute hypoxia or buildup of byproducts of exercises that causes that intracellular swelling, that pump, and that anabolic signal to occur. The primary way we're gonna get this within the gym is by doing light weights anywhere from 40 to 60% to failure. Long sets that can last from 60 to 120 seconds long, we're really trying to make those muscles burn. These are subjective measures. Looking at things like the volume of blood within a muscle is something you can maybe see or feel, but it's a little harder to measure. Also, that burning sensation is another subjective measure, but it's important to pay attention to that. If you're trying to elicit a lot of metabolic stress, you should be looking for those things within your training. If your muscles are getting flat, if you're not feeling them burn, or if you're not getting a pump, that means that we either need to increase the intensity or change something to be able to make that happen a little bit better. Now again, lightweight, high reps to failure, and being able to compound that stress with truncated rest periods, anywhere from 10 to 30, maybe even 60 seconds long, but you're not gonna rest to a full recovery. You want that compounding effect to accumulate over the course of sets so that you're able to get to failure, even with a really lightweight or a band. Finally, the last mechanism we talked about was muscle damage that micro tearing that occurs at the fiber level, where the sarcolemma tears and the myosin and actin bonds start to become a little bit damaged. The primary mechanism we use in the gym to elicit this is the use of eccentrics, working the negative portions of movement where muscles are lengthening. We can do this anywhere from three to five, even 10 second negatives long, using things like overload eccentrics is also great, but be able to keep the muscle under tension and work it nice and slow is vital for eliciting that muscle damage. And remember, we want you to be a little sore, but not too much. You shouldn't walk away from training sessions totally scot-free. You should be sore for maybe one or two days, but we don't want to get too excessive or you're not able to come back in the gym or that tissue is not able to remodel and heal nice and strong. This is where you can use those subjective measures of how you're feeling to be able to gauge how much volume you should use for eccentrics, whether it's too much muscle damage or not enough. Finally, we talked about muscle damage or the micro tearing that can occur in muscle fibers as a response to the demands of our training. You know, a lot of these mechanisms occur within each other. Oftentimes when there's a lot of muscle tension, there's also a lot of uh, muscle damage. Oftentimes when there's a lot of muscle damage, there's a lot of metabolic stress occurring as well. But this mechanism is gonna be a primary focus by using eccentrics or negative portions of movement as muscles are lengthening using tempos anywhere from three to five, even 10 seconds long, using things like overload eccentrics, vitally important for being able to get the most out of your time with regard to muscle damage. And remember, we don't want too much, we don't want not enough, we want you to walk away a little bit sore from each session, maybe for one or two days. So what are the applications for hypertrophy training? Who should be doing it and why should they be doing it? Well, here's a case for hypertrophy training within any training system. First, by targeting hypertrophy training, by increasing the amount of musculature we have, we know that we can increase performance simply by getting more biological adaptations to your hardware, just making you bigger and stronger to be able to then learn how to use that musculature more efficiently through specific training. Another important piece to hypertrophy training is rehabilitation. The unique thing about hypertrophy training is that we can get a very strong response without having to increase speed or load. 
Speed and load are the two biggest players when it comes to injury. And I know when I had my back surgery, the first thing I started doing was light controlled movement to be able to increase the musculature around my spine. So hypertrophy training is great rehabilitation for people who may not be able to go fast or heavy yet. We can still elicit a lot of metabolic stress and a lot of muscle damage without putting a lot of weight on the bar, without going as fast as possible. Working mechanical weaknesses. This is a great application for hypertrophy. Everyone has different anthropometric measurements, different mechanical advantages based on their body type. For instance, someone with really long arms might have a little bit more advantage deadlifting than say somebody with short arms, but they may be challenged with things like, I don't know, handstand push-ups. Someone like my wife, who's got a really long torso and very short arms, is amazing at handstand push-ups and going overhead, but really struggles at things like deadlifting. So what we can do is we can target hypertrophy training due to the lagging muscle group or mechanical disadvantage. For instance, the person who really struggles with handstand push-ups might focus a little bit more on working the triceps and shoulders to compensate for that deficiency. Somebody like my wife who really struggles pulling off the ground because she's got a long torso and short arms might benefit from doing extra lower back work to be able to strengthen that deficiency because she knows she has a bit of a mechanical disadvantage there. This is the best application for isolation movements. Isolation movements is where we work individual muscles with movements that are a little bit less functional. It's the difference between doing a bicep curl versus a full pull up. And while isolation movements can be amazing at working on asymmetries or improving specific muscles, lagging muscle groups, or working a, a, a different mechanical weakness, in no way should they replace a complete training program. You will never cure metabolic disease with bicep curls. It's not gonna happen. So fitness and functional movement should all be the main piece, but within context, isolation movements can be quite beneficial, especially as a garnish to creating a more complete or individualized program. Finally, we can think about things like longevity and personal reward. I gotta tell you, I've talked to lots of people and I've been exposed to thousands of gyms and thousands of athletes. And most of them tell me when I ask them why they train, that the reason why they train is because they wanna look good and they wanna feel good. So a training program should be serving those two things. If aesthetics are an important piece for you within a training program, and it allows you to come back every day and feel rewarded and sustain a program through your life, absolutely do that. Not everyone should be aiming to be a CrossFit Games athlete or an elite athlete. Most people just want to look good naked. That doesn't mean they still can't be fit and pursue fitness. It's not really one or the other. It's performance and aesthetics together. So by giving people access to be able to achieve the aesthetics they're looking for through hypertrophy training, you'll have more sustainable clients, they'll want to come back to you longer, and overall they'll tend to feel more rewarded. If you spend a lot of time in the gym, you should look like you do. You should be able to wear it on your body. And that's what we want for people. So how do we program for hypertrophy within the gym? The actual practical application of this in a class setting with yourself or with your athletes. Where there are multiple different ways or templates we can use to do that. Essentially with all of them, we're gonna be biasing or even targeting hypertrophy a little bit more than a traditional fully rounded program. However, that doesn't mean that we still can't pursue fitness or maintain it through this process. The first thing we can do is try a dedicated hypertrophy program. This is a program that only utilizes hypertrophy a few days a week, and we could alternate that with general physical preparation on the other days. So for instance, at Thunderbro, we have our 90-day Get Huge program. This is a program with a tremendous amount of volume. It elicits a lot of muscle damage. People walk away sore. The program is only meant to be done three days a week, say on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So what we could do with that is we could introduce more functional fitness conditioning or GPP on Tuesday and Thursday. So we can still stay fit as we're getting bigger. Another way we could do that is by using a hybrid program. This is where we integrate hypertrophy training with functional fitness. So say you're out there and you're doing CrossFit or something a little bit more functionally fitness oriented than just hypertrophy. What we do with a program like this 
is introduce the hypertrophy work at the front end of the program with four or five specific exercises that are going to really break muscle down. And then at the end of each day, we get a good conditioning workout in. Maybe even a conditioning workout that correlates with the muscle groups we've worked in that hypertrophy training. Think at Thunderbro, we have our online muscle anarchy program that does precisely this. We have athletes in gyms all around the world doing their hypertrophy training and then conditioning after so that they can stay fit as they get bigger. And then finally, we could do something like a hypertrophy finisher. This is where we need to change very little from our program if we're out there doing functional fitness or CrossFit. You can do your regular workout, but at the end of the workout, you're gonna take 10 minutes to target a specific muscle group or a specific function with hypertrophy training. At Thunderbro, we've written our 100 10-minute hypertrophy finishers that crush specifically for this purpose. You don't have to abandon functional fitness to target hypertrophy. In fact, this is a great way to individualize programs for athletes, targeting their specific weakness or deficiency with hypertrophy training as a garnish after their workout to be able to still get some good hypertrophy work in every day while maintaining a rounded program. Either way, the idea here is to never abort fitness. Fitness is always the main thing. It's always the centerpiece. The garnish may be the, the hypertrophy training. And how you put that together is completely up to you. It's contextual based on what you're trying to achieve, how fast you want to achieve it, what your time and logistics allow you to do. But I can tell you there are achievable ways for anybody to introduce hypertrophy training into their program while st still staying very fit and while still pursuing fitness and performance. So just to review guys, we started off the day by talking about how and why performance and aesthetics are linked together. Then we dove into the science of hypertrophy at the cellular and muscle fiber level. We discussed all the different mechanisms within the body that can help drive muscle hypertrophy. And then we looked at the training factors within the gym that correlate with those mechanisms. We discussed the different benefits and applications of hypertrophy for different athletes. And then finally, we looked at how to actually integrate and apply this stuff within training and programming. If you guys have any questions about any of this stuff, you can always DM us on Instagram at Thunderbro, or you can DM me at Dave Freak and Lipson, or check out one of our books, specifically the one titled Hypertrophy Func for Functional Fitness, that dives even deeper into each one of these categories so that you can get a better understanding of this stuff for yourself and for your athletes. Our number one goal is for everybody to be able to achieve the things they want to achieve, to be able to feel happy, satisfied, and rewarded in the gym. And like I said, for most people, it's all about looking good and feeling good. So let's get you guys looking great and performing like athletes.